Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Can everybody hear me okay? Just want to do a sound check. Okay, good, good. We'll give everyone a couple minutes to join, inshallah. Uh, I hope, inshallah, that everybody is doing well. Um, I hope and pray that everybody is healthy and um, that your families are well, inshallah, and that everyone's staying safe and that you're conscious, uh, inshallah, of yourself and the world around you. Um, welcome back to our Sunday study of uh, for, for 30 and up for um, Ibn Atta'illah a great scholar, his curriculum on spiritual development, um, where he talks about different topics that uh, relate to the development of someone's faith and spirituality uh, from a really practical level, from something that's very practical and uh, very much easy to reflect on. And so the goal is that each Sunday we come together and we read some of his book, uh, which is called Taj al-Aruz, and uh, we try to read some of it and translate some of it and get as much benefit as we can from him and the commentators. Uh, so he says, today's topic is actually really profound uh, and really interesting. When I opened it up, I, I kind of, for a moment, I stumbled over reading it because um, his profundity, the, the, just the, the weight of his words are so awesome. Um, but today's topic is uh, what he calls the, um, you know, amazement with someone's obedience okay uh the mystery of obedience he calls it things that are when a person obeys allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he said these are, this is one of the mysteries of acts of obeying allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and worshiping god um and obviously when we think of doing good deeds when we think of doing actions and worshiping allah these are things that without a doubt are positive you know and uh the prophet muhammad sallallahu said in a hadith that the Prophet very clearly said that one of the signs that you're a believer is that you enjoy doing good deeds. And that's one of the things that we've mentioned here before is that when you get up and pray, despite maybe not wanting to at first, when you complete your prayer, you feel better about yourself. Or when you give charity, despite maybe not wanting to at first, when you are able to complete that act of charity, you feel better. And um, this is one of the things that the Prophet Sallallahu told us, that one of the signs of belief is that you enjoy doing good deeds. It makes you happy, um, even if it might be difficult, but you, 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 feel, you feel satisfied. You feel uh, you know, gra graciously satisfied with Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala that he gave you the chance to do that. And the other side is that if a bad deed or if a sin or a mistake, if it makes you feel upset, if it disappoints you, um, and that's one of the things that the Prophet Sallallahu said, you know, and he defines in other hadith as well that a person, when they do good, the believer should, their heart should feel good and happy. And when they do bad, their heart should feel constricted. Their heart should feel tight. Um, so these are sort of the, uh, the default reactions that the human heart should have when it comes to uh, doing good deeds. Now, there are different layers and levels of doing good deeds and there can be different reactions um it is very possible at the same time you know and, and we view islam as a as a holistic experience so we don't you know whenever it comes to islam we try our best to be able to appreciate it as a total experience not just one part 
um, because really so much of it is interconnected. And so at the same time that the Prophet ﷺ tells us that good deeds, part of doing good deeds is that we feel, you know, we feel appreciative and we feel great about doing good deeds. At the same time that we have that, we also have a lot of warnings, both in the Quran and the Sunnah, of doing good deeds and feeling a sense of pride. Um, and again, not good pride. It's okay to feel proud of yourself, but a sense of pride that leads to perhaps a sense of arrogance, um, makes makes you look down on other people, um, or even can make a person feel lazy about their own good deeds that they follow up with that. So if a person maybe does something good, and then they feel like, you know what, after this, I really don't have to do much. Um, I already did this, you know, I donated in Ramadan, so I really don't have to do charity for the rest of the year. Or I prayed uh, in Ramadan, so I really don't have to focus my prayers the rest of the year. It sounds, you know, when we say it like that, it sounds a little bit strange. I don't think, I hope, inshallah, like none of us have verbally admitted this. Um, but despite the, the fact that we haven't verbally said it, maybe, maybe our actions, our internal state, um, maybe our heart has felt comfortable with that. That, you know, I, I really, Ramadan this year, I, I did more than I normally do. And so we don't feel as guilty when we don't perform our acts of worship outside of that. So this whole chapter is actually dedicated to a very interesting phenomenon that can occur in the heart of a person. And that is what happens when a person does good deeds. And the result of that good deed is that instead of feeling, you know, satisfied and happy and, and, you know, grateful to Allah that he gave them that chance. What happens if a person starts to feel lazy? And what happens if a person starts to feel, um, you know, arrogant? They start to have a sense of, uh, of, of, of blameworthy pride that comes within them. And he says, what, what happens then? And why does that happen? And then he talks about, what about the person who does a bad deed? What about the person who sins? And as a result of their sin, they feel a sense of, of, of shame. They feel a sense of brokenness. And that brokenness and that shame that they feel, that regret, it pushes them to yearn and to climb back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so he describes this. This is like a really interesting experience. So, and this is why I love Ibn Atta'ala because he's very real. You know, I think he's describing something that is, we're all vulnerable to which is that when we all do good, of course we feel good about it, but there is a sense maybe perhaps of arrogance that can arise from that. And when we when we stumble, of course, you know, a person who commits wrong, it's not always the case that they enjoy it. You know, sometimes it's just a weakness, right? A lot of times I would say it's just a weakness. There are so many stories in the life of the Prophet ﷺ where the people who did really bad things, like really bad things, and then immediately afterwards, it's almost like, they came back to their senses and they ran back to the Prophet Sallallahu and they told him like, Ya Rasulullah, what have I done? You know, and they felt so ashamed of themselves. And I, I, I personally really connect and relate to those stories because I know that when, when I make a mistake, whatever it is, whether it's big or small, any personal mistake that I make, um, it's, it's not that I necessarily as a person was like, yeah, I don't care about God. Um, I do care about Allah, of course, but it's my own weakness, right? And that's why Allah Ta'ala's mercy has to be greater than our sins. Because we'll never be strong enough to not have weaknesses. But Allah Ta'ala's mercy will always cover our weaknesses, right? And so I love that he wrote this. I think it's very powerful. Um, so let's go ahead and read. He says, يَقُولُ إِبْنَ عَطَاءِ اللَّهِ يُصَلِّ رَجُلُ رَكَعَتَيْنِ فَيَعْتَمِدُ عَلَيْهِمَا وَيُرْكِنْ إِلَيْهِمَا وَيُعْجَبُ بِهِمَا فَهَذِهِ حَسَنَةٌ he said that there is an example of a person who prays to raka'ah. So they pray to raka'ah and they, um, they, they basically rely on that. Um, they lean on it. You know, it's kind of a word that he's using. Um, they rely on it. They lean on it. It's almost like um, somebody who's really in putting, putting everything into something, right? Like when you lean on a wall, you're, you're kind of like, you know, وَيُرْكِنْ إِلَيْهِمَا Like they make this like their pillar. Um, uh, you know, they, they kind of lean on it. They put all of their... They, they, their entire life is supported by that action. 
uh, and they become enamored by themselves uh, and what they've done. You know, it's almost like a person who he's describing as like celebrating the good that they've done and they're celebrating themselves. Um, so then he describes this. He says, what kind of deed is this? He says, فَهَذِهِ حَسَنَةٌ أَحَطَّتْ بِهَا سَيِّئَةُ That uh, this is a good deed that um, that bad deeds have taken from it or it's surrounded by evil, okay? That it's surrounded and bad deeds have sort of like uh, infiltrated it, yeah. Um, and he says, وَآخِرْ يَفْعَلْ الْمَعْصِيَةُ فَتَكْسِبُهُ الذِّلَّةِ وَالْإِنْكِسَارِ وَيَضِيمُ الْمَسْكَنَةِ وَالْإِفْتِقَارِ فَهَذِهِ سَيِّئَةٌ أَحَطَّتْ بِهِ أَرْ بِهَا حَسَنَاتٍ So he says that, and then there's another person who they do something disobedient of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they commit a disobedience, and he says, and as a result of that, they inherit, and they, um, you know, within them comes this sense of humiliation, ذِلَّة they, they feel ashamed of themselves. And he describes the feeling perfectly. I mean, this is what everybody feels when we commit a mistake, when we commit a sin. He says that, you know, um, He says that, and they, they, they persist then in their neediness and they realize their neediness in that moment, and also they develop a strong sense of yearning for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like as a result of that. Um, so they basically feel like a shell of themselves, and they realize that they have to turn themselves around. And he describes it, he says, this is an evil deed. This is a deed that they did that was evil, that's surrounded by good. Um, so I kind of want to pick this apart because there's a lot of language here that I think will be beneficial to us. The first thing that I think is really interesting about the language he's using is that when he describes um, when he describes the deeds, he doesn't describe like a lifestyle. He describes a moment. So he says, uh, yusalli He says that there's a person who prays to raka'ah. They pray to raka'ah. Um, to raka'ah, of course, is a good deed. To raka'ah is a good deed. It's better to pray, you know, to raka'ah of nafil than it is not to. But it's not like. And it's not a massive good deed. It's interesting that he's referring to something that is kind of on the smaller side of the scale of goodness. Obviously, sincerity, there's so much involved in how Allah would weigh that deed, but the amount of the deed is not massive. And it's interesting because he's describing a small good deed, and he says that this person, part of their flaw, part of their vulnerability is that they see something that they did that was small and they uh, they magnify it. They, they, they make it so, they exacerbate it. They make it so great in their eyes. And so what do they do? So that they start to, they start to uh, become conceited about it. They start to uh, rely on themselves because of it. They, they think that it's like they're, they, they basically make it a pillar of their life. They start to celebrate it. They think that they're so great as a result of it. And so he says, like, all of these, um, this laziness and this arrogance that develops from just these two rak'at, he says, this is a good deed. You can't remove the fact that this is a good deed. He said, but it's surrounded and it's completely infiltrated by evil. And it makes you wonder, like, the two rak'at that you prayed, you gained so much harm from that. That, like, Why? Right, and again, it's not blaming it on the action. Of course, it's more so how the person reacted to their action. Right? It's like if a person received a briefcase of money, and then they uh, invested it, or and then they went and they, uh, you know, blew it on something like gambling or something. It's not the money's fault, right? It's not the 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 the, the capital that they had. It was how they reacted to it. So this deed is a good deed. There's no doubt, but. If a person uses this good deed to start to like become lazy with Allah and to start celebrating themselves, and that leads them to think that they don't have to do anything more, then he says he describes it says this is a good deed surrounded by bad deeds. It's very interesting, right? Um, and then he says the opposite. He says, and there is another person, yafal al ma'asiyah. They do one bad deed. So both of them, both people, are not doing a lot of what they're doing. So there is one side, the person who's doing one, you know, one action, one good deed. Then there's one person who does one bad deed. And that one bad deed, their heart is so pure 
this person, despite the fact that they commit this sin, whatever the sin is, their heart is so pure that like it impacts them so deeply that they feel a sense of, of brokenness and distance and they feel upset with themselves. They're disappointed. Um, they don't just brush it off. They don't just say, you know what, it's no big deal. But their heart is so pure that they are like, what have I done? Right? And it pushes them to feel this sense of uh, humiliation and brokenness before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it forces them to realize their own spiritual depravity and poverty. And, and, and then they they have this now, this this guilt-fueled yearning for Allah, that I want to return back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just like how you would apologize to a loved one. If you hurt a loved one and you apologize to them, you said something wrong or you did something wrong, you would apologize to them and your heart would be like 100% focused on trying to recover that relationship. So that's what he's describing here. And he says, this was one bad deed. That it's one bad deed, but it's surrounded by so much good. Um, and again, the reason why I'm trying to translate it really slowly is because I think that if we translate it quickly, it's one of those things that can be misunderstood. And the, the commentator, he says very beautifully, he says that Ibn Atta'illah, he further expands on the reality of this moment with one of his statements that he has in another book called al Hikam, which a lot of people probably have heard of, um, where he says, uh, that it's possible that Allah Ta'ala, or that the door, Allah here is, is not mentioned specifically, but it's possible that the door of obedience would be open for you but the door of acceptance would not be. So it's possible that a person can do a good deed, but that deed not be accepted from them, okay? It, it's possible that a person could stand up and pray, right? Futiha laka bab at ta'at, that a person can stand up and, and the door of obedience was open to them. But wama, wama futiha laka bab al qubul. But the acceptance of that prayer hasn't been written for that person yet. Because of something, right? Maybe that person had arrogance or they had something wrong with them. He says that maybe it's possible that a person could be destined a sin, and that sin can be the reason that that person attains and reaches a connection with. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he says that ma'asiya, disobedience of Allah, awrathat dhilla wa inkisar, khayrun min ta'at awrathat izan or azza wa istikbar. So he says that the sin that um, begets, uh, you know, disappointment in oneself and humility within oneself and uh, makes a person reflect on on their brokenness that returns them back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, Khairun min ta'at, that it's better than obedience that a person has that can give them a sense of uh, overinflated pride and, and arrogance before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? Overinflated pride and arrogance. So this is a really, really deep lesson. Now he mentions a hadith. The commentator here, he mentions a hadith. And he mentions this hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu to give us even further understanding. What is the lesson here? What's principle number one? Principle number one is that not every deed on the outside is the same on the inside. Okay? Not every deed on the outside is the same on the inside. So obviously we know with good deeds, we want there to be the goodness of the outside. We want the, the zahir of the amal to be nice. So we want the, the outward appearance of the deed to be good. But we also want to make sure that in the Mal'a'malu bin Niyat, that the Prophet ﷺ said that, you know, your, your deeds are done by their intentions. So we want to make sure that whatever's going on inside is also good. And this is why when we've been talking about in, in our class on Tuesdays and Thursdays, Imam Ghazali's book on prayer, we've been talking about just not performing the prayer like it's a yoga class, right? We're, try, we're trying to perform prayer. No offense to anyone who does yoga, mashallah, but we're trying to perform prayer that it's more than just like calisthenics. We want to perform prayer in a way that is internally different, that there's something happening internally. In the same way, subhanAllah, think about this, man, like, you know, to understand that things can be happening inside of you, think about you watching a movie. 
when you're watching a movie, are you moving around? No, you're sitting. Like you're whether you're watching like an action scene or whether you're watching like a tragic scene or whether you're watching a comedic scene, like there's so much happening inside of you. Imam Ghazali calls it Amal al Khulub, the actions of the heart. There's movements, harakat. There's movements of the heart that are happening internally, but you're just sitting, like you're just relaxing on your chair. So to think about when you do a good deed, you want to make sure that your actions inside are also good. So what does this mean? It means that when I'm praying, I'm actually focusing on my prayer. It means that when I'm giving charity, I'm not showing off. Uh, I'm not thinking about the tax return, right? Tax return might be a reality, sure. And it's your right, according to the government, absolutely. But is that my number one reason why I'm doing it? Am I trying to, you know, am I donating the zakat and I'm thinking about how it's going to lower me one income bracket so I can, you know, save 2% on my federal income tax? These are the kinds of conversations that, again, we have to be very, very aware of internally what's happening, right? It's almost like you have to listen to your heart. You have to listen to what's going on. When you do something, you have to listen to yourself. Like, why am I doing this? Why? How? What's my motivation for doing this, right? I want to make sure that my motivation is as pure as possible, that I'm not trying to do this for any other reason. I'm not trying to show off to somebody. I'm not trying to uh, get some sort of material benefit. This is just between me and Allah. Right. And that's why a lot of scholars will talk about what to hedged in the middle of the night, qiyam in the middle of the night. And they'll say, like, this is the best environment to develop that because there's literally no one to show off to. You're tired. You want to sleep and you force yourself to get up. Maybe you can't pray. Maybe you're just too tired to even stand and pray. But you force yourself to get up and open your hands and make dua to Allah. The scholars are like, that's that's like the Black Friday of uh, of sincerity. That's like the Memorial Day sale of sincerity. Like you can't get better deals than that, right? Doing sincere deeds only when people are around is tough. It's difficult. So this is kind of what he's talking about. Like he's kind of trying to give us this idea of, look, don't just become so accustomed to doing good deeds on the outside. But he's also saying, by the way, he's not saying if you can't master sincerity, then just give it all up. That's not what he's saying either, right? Because we're not, Islam is not a zero sum game, right? We're not like either I'm perfect or I'm nothing. That's not how this works. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts partial credit. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts partial credit. He accepts everything that we try, even if it's not perfect. Allah ta'ala accepts the, the, the sincerity from us, can elevate, you know, and that, that humility from us can elevate a poor performance, right? That's why immediately after the prayer, what is the first? What are the first three words that are uttered according to the Sunnah, sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? What are the first three words? Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah. Like you just got done praying, and the first three things that you say after doing something good, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah. Why? Why are you seeking Allah's forgiveness after praying? Because you're you're showing Allah your humility. It's similar to a person who got you like the best birthday gift ever. And as they're giving it to you, they're saying what? I hope you like it. I hope you like it. I don't know if you're going to like it. I hope you like it. They're not walking into the, they're not walking in saying, oh my God, everybody else who got you a gift, just return it right now. No competition. Okay. Make sure you save those gift receipts that everyone else has because you want to, you're going to want to return that stuff because it's not as good as mine. That. You know, imagine doing good deeds with such arrogance. That's what the person he's describing. That's the first example he's describing. That there's a person who does a good deed and they think as a result of that good deed, like, close it up. Close it up. Wrap it up. We're going home, right? Like, no one else can practice Islam like this. You know, that's the that's that person. And then the second person is the one who, even when they make a mistake, it still reminds them of Allah. There are some people, subhanAllah, man, there are some people who, when, when we do good deeds, we're only reminded of ourselves, even while we're doing good deeds. And there are some people who, even while they commit sins, they still think of Allah. It, it, Allah never escapes their mind. He never escapes their mind. Obviously, that when they do good, they think of Allah. But when they do bad, they think of Allah, too, because they're so, again, they reach a state of disappointment and they want to be better than that. So this is what he's describing. So he says, don't think, don't think. He says, don't think that just because you're doing something means that Allah is accepting it. And this is why Shaykh Abdul Nasser, 
my teacher, he always tells us, pray that Allah accepts. Pray that Allah accepts. As Ibrahim, you might be hearing my daughter, the baby eagle behind me. As Ibrahim alayhi salam, as he says, you know, Rabbana taqabbal minna. Oh, Allah accept this from us. After building the Kaaba, can you guys imagine? Building the Kaaba, building the Kaaba. And the first thing he utters, oh, Allah accept this, accept this. It's that humility is just amazing. So what are some of the narrations that he quotes that we'll start? Because I want to make sure we finish this chapter today, inshallah. It's a short chapter. So he says, uh, he says that, um, He says that, you know, there, he quotes a hadith in Tabarani where the Prophet Sallallahu says that there is a person who prays and they pray their prayers uh, that they, uh, sorry, that there is a person who prays on time and they perform their wudu uh, and they perfect the standing part of the prayer and the quality and the bowing and the prostration. Okay, um, and they do all of that beautifully, and he says that they leave. Okay, khurijat baydau musfiratun that they leave the prayer illuminated. After the prayer is done, they've left it like illuminated, right, bright. And it is said to them, the prayer says to them, taqul. The prayer will say to them on the day of judgment, hafadakallahu uh, kama hafadtani that may Allah protect you just like you've protected me, right? And we talked about this actually, I think Imam Ghazali quoted the same hadith in, in our other class, okay? And he says, and there's another person who prays, وَمَنْ صَلَّ لِغَيْرِ وَقْتِهَا وَلَمْ يُصْبِغَ لَهَا وُضُوءَهَا That there's a person who prays and they, they don't pray on time and they don't perform their wudu correctly and they don't really uh, perfect their standing or their concentration or their bowing or their prostration that he says, like, basically their prayer, they do their prayer, like they do the prayer, okay? And this is, think about us. Think about all the prayers that we've done where it was just trying to check it off of a list. Just trying to check it off of a list. And he says that they do this, and he says that, uh, you know, that they are, uh, they are, they are they're just in complete and total darkness. The opposite of illumination, right? So, like, brightness of the lights, and the darkness of a dark corner, that they are just completely and totally humiliated in darkness after performing this prayer. And the prayer says back to them, okay, that the prayer says, Allah, Allahu, sorry, kama that may Allah, uh, you know, basically you have, may Allah Ta'ala humiliate you in the same way that you've humiliated me, right? May Allah Ta'ala do this to you in the same way that you, you've done this to me, like abandoned, a humiliating abandonment. Um, that just like, and, and, and this is going to be said to that person, in this way, until the prayer is folded up and... What happens? Just like you, you fold up a sheet or a blanket, um, and thumma daraba biha wajhahu. That it's gonna, the prayer is basically gonna be thrown back at this person's face. Okay, so that's the narration in Tabarani, where the Prophet Sallallahu is describing this, and he's saying that the, two, the both people prayed, but one person they prayed with such perfection and such beauty and such you know such honesty in their prayer and the other person basically just phoned it in. They were like, whatever, it's not a big deal. And the reality is that the prayer responds. So this is a very interesting like mental exercise. When we pray, imagine after your prayer that your prayer is responding to you. Imagine when you say, Salaam alaikum warahmatullah, Salaam alaikum warahmatullah. Imagine that you're, stand, you're sitting there and your prayer is like talking back to you basically. And either the prayer is happy with you or the prayer is disappointed in you, right? So that's a very powerful one. Uh, where he says, "Wa yusumuna fima fama qima tu siyamuhum." He says, "Qala rubba saimun leisa lahu min siyamahu illa jiu." He said he's quoting now a narration from Ibn Majah that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said that there are some people who, when they fast, they only 
uh, gain from their fast, nothing except for hunger. That this person, there are some people who stand in the night and pray, and all they gain from it is uh, tiredness, is being awake when they're tired. Okay, being awake when they're tired. So this idea that the action itself is enough, is always accepted, is 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 um, the action itself is enough and, and the internal side is not being accounted for, is something that we have the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi addressing numerous, numerous, numerous times um, to us. So then he continues and he says that, uh, that ibadah, worship, is the body, okay, in the ibadah to jism, that it's the body, القبول, uh, الإلهي, that and uh, its spirit is the acceptance that God gives it or God's acceptance of it. Okay, so if you think of your ibad uh, of, of your body, your body is one thing, but without a soul, it's nothing. When the soul leaves the body, what happens to the body? It's dead. Okay. When the engine leaves the car, what happens to the car? It might look like a car on the outside, but it's not working. You, you know, you're turning the key and nothing's going because the engine's been removed. So he says, your ibadah is the body. When we pray, when we fast, when we give sadaqah, all of that is the body of our, our, our deeds. But he says the ruh of it is God's acceptance of it, is when God accept it, accepts it. Um, and so he mentions and he says that, you know, these moments of obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, they are nothing unless Allah accepts it from us. They are nothing unless Allah accepts it from us. So he says, people have to do their actions in the method and in the style internally of completion so that God will accept it. So that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will accept it. Okay, and he says only then will a person start to enjoy uh, doing, you know, lengthening their good deeds and doing good deeds at length. And he mentions this, um, and he says specifically, right? Um, he then continues and he quotes and he says that. So, so what is what is? Let's pause here for a second. The first reason why a person goes back to that initial flaw of celebrating such small good. And the reason why a person might have that beautiful characteristic of feeling very uh, regretful over doing even a small bad deed is because that person, how much they think of Allah. That's number one. If I'm never thinking of Allah, if I'm only thinking of myself, when I do a good deed, I'm still thinking about myself. When I do a bad deed, I'm thinking about myself. But when, I, when I'm thinking about Allah and I do a good deed, I'm still thinking about Allah. And when I do a bad deed, I'm still thinking about Allah. It's powerful, right? The second thing he's mentioning here is the second reason why this happens is because the person thinks that the body has no soul. That person who does not remember Allah after they pray or in prayer, they think that their body, a body has no soul. That's their problem, right? So that's why he says, your worship is just your body. He says, but the soul of that worship is his, is his acceptance. So naturally a person is going to sit there and say, man, I want to make sure that this is accepted because what good is my action if it's not accepted? All this time, all this, and think of everything we do for Allah, all the energy, all the time, all the sacrifice, everything. Imagine if we didn't get that accepted by Allah. How, what a waste. It would, what a waste, right? And, this, and, the, and the sad thing is, we're doing the same deed, we're spending the same time, we're doing the same actions, we may as well just try to really focus on it so that we know that it's accepted. So that we can tell Allah, we don't know if it's accepted, but oh Allah, we did our best. We absolutely did our best. So that's what he's saying. And he says, when you worship Allah al-aslub in this method, in this style, uh, uh, you know, he says in completion, right? Like when you try to, when you put an effort to complete, okay, and do it properly, he says that you start to understand haqiqatuha wa thamaratuha. You are start to understand the reality of that deed. You start to benefit from the fruits of that deed, okay? And you start to taste the sweetness of it and you actually even want to 
do it even further, even longer. You want to pray more. You want to give more charity. You want to do better things. Um, so that's number two. Okay. Um, now he says, what is the uh, what is the what is the reason why somebody can think of anyone else besides Allah while they're doing a good deed? And this is a really serious sin. It's called riya. Riya is a really serious sin. What's the reason why somebody can think of anyone else besides Allah when they do a good deed? He says that um, just like a person's deeds are not accepted if they're done for anybody else. He said a person's heart will not accept. Uh, a person's heart does not benefit from those deeds that are done from somebody else. Okay? He says, كما لا يقبل العمل المشترك لا يحب القلب المشترك. He says that العمل المشترك لا يقبله القلب المشترك لا يقبل عليه. That the heart won't accept it either. So a person's heart will not benefit from the deeds that are done or co-opted by somebody else that have like a, a partner in its intention, okay? So just like Allah Ta'ala won't accept it, He says that the true heart, the true iman and faith of a person won't benefit from those deeds either. So this is something that we have to be really careful of. Is like, if I keep praying and keep praying and keep praying and I don't find that it's benefiting me, maybe... There's something wrong with my approach and intention and performance and internal action of the prayer, right? Maybe that's what I'm struggling with. And that's why when I finish prayer, I don't feel anything. Because like he said, لا يقبل عليه, that the heart won't accept it. It won't, it won't engage with it. It won't even, you know, it won't compute. Format not accepted, right? Um, so he says that, uh, you know, this is, found primarily in when a person is showing off or is doing something with vanity, okay? Min riya or wa ujub, ujub. He says that it's found when a person has, when they start to like find sweetness in doing things for the sake of showing off or for the sake of vanity, okay? Um, and he says that the heart that is co-opted, it loves everything else besides what it should be loving. The heart that is compromised, the heart that is corrupted, it loves everything else besides what it should be loving, okay? Um, and then he narrates, subhanAllah, a very powerful narration where the Prophet Sallallahu says, it is considered on the weaker side, but he says, you know, thalatha muthlikat shuh muta'un wa hawa matbar'un wa ijab al mar'a bi nafsihi. He says there are three things that will absolutely destroy a person. He says number one is stinginess that is uh, that is that that is controlling of a person. Stinginess that controls somebody. Desires that are followed without question. Okay, so number one is stinginess that controls somebody. It's almost like it shackled that person. They're so stingy that they always constantly are following whatever the stinginess tells them to do. They're shackled by it. Number two. Wahawa uh mutabbi'un mutabbi'un that the person follows all of their desires and that a person that a person is so enamored by themselves, like they're so impressed by themselves. They're like, wow, I'm I'm a great person, like I'm I'm good, like I'm better than other people. And he says these the Prophet says, these three things are absolutely destructive. They will completely and totally uh destroy this person. Okay. Um, so then he says that, so these are, these are why this person can do that. So then he says, subhanAllah, he says that worship, he says worship, al-ubudiyyah tunafi, that worship is incompatible with bragging, as sulf okay? That worship, a person who's truly embodied the aspect of worship, it should be uh, completely and totally incompatible with bragging and boasting. Okay, a sulful khabra that it should be it should be not able to do those things. Okay, he says janib that this person should actually be very humble and it should uh, and it makes humility very easy upon this person and they should be easygoing uh, with others as a result of that. They shouldn't be judgmental of other people as a result of that. Okay. Um, and then he finishes with the last narration that I wanted to that I wanted to quote here. It's a narration from Sahih Muslim, actually. Um, 
And he mentions, subhanAllah, that, you know, a person who experiences disobedience from Allah and that makes them repent, it's better than somebody who experiences arrogance as a result of their worship, right? And this is a, a statement by a great Egyptian scholar, Muhammad al-Ghazali, not the Imam al-Ghazali, but Muhammad al-Ghazali, who is uh, who is recent, uh, much more contemporary, um, that he says that a person who turns back to Allah, okay, this person who has, uh, you know, yearns for Allah after committing a sin is better than the one who has kibriya uh, after, you know, being a worshiper, basically. And if you think of shaitan, it's kind of a very interesting parallel that's being painted there. Um but he actually mentions a, a hadith as a, as, a, as a proof of this, where the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu he says in a hadith, and this hadith is mentioned in Sahih Muslim, but it's also in uh, some other uh, books as well. You'll find it uh, in some other collections, where he says, "Anna rajulan qala wallahi la yaghfirullahu li fulanin. That the Prophet Sallallahu is saying about this interesting conversation, this person swears, that Allah will never forgive somebody. Wallahi la yaghfiru Allahu li fulanin. That Allah will never forgive this person. Wa inna Allah ta'ala qala. Allah responds to that person, that claim, that 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 claim that a person is making on behalf of Allah. He says, Man dha alladhi yata'ala or yata'ala alayya, alayya. He says, what kind of person could be, uh, could swear by me, okay, that that I would that I would not forgive this person. Like what kind of person would do that? He says, "An la aghfira li fulan." Like what person would ever make that 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 pledge or that swear? Fa inni kad ghafartu li fulanin. Number one, I have forgiven this person. This person, the person that you said would never be forgiven, they've been forgiven. Okay. Wa ahbatatu amalaka, and I have completely destroyed your deeds when i have completely destroyed your deeds subhanallah so this is the conclusion that the commentator gives in this section where he mentions the danger of a person uh feeling as though their good deeds are a sign that they are a chosen person and that everybody else who makes mistakes is a person who is far away from Allah to the point where the person grows and says, you know what, Allah will never be able to forgive these people. Allah will never forgive these people for what they've done. Those kinds of statements are things that human beings cannot say, right? Because again, we have very little understanding of the spiritual dimension of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like we just don't know. We don't know what everyone's relationship with Allah is like. Allah ta'ala forgives people. Allah ta'ala doesn't accept certain things from people, right? If somebody does something and they don't have any sincerity, then maybe it's not accepted. And if somebody makes a mistake, right, the whole lesson of this chapter is if somebody does something that looks good, but they have no sincerity and all they care about is themselves, he said, sure, they've done a good deed, but what has that led to them? It's led to them being what? It's done to be'id of them. All they are now is further away, right, of Allah Ta'ala. And, 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 and a person who has committed a sin, but they feel remorseful about that, what has that done for them? Yes, they've committed a sin, but the tawbah that they're engaging in, the repentance that they're engaging in, it's brought them so much closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that they're actually in a state, their 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 aggregate, their net is better than where they were before. Right? So this is a very powerful lesson for us to think about our own awareness of what's going on internally as we're doing something. If you're doing a good deed, if I'm doing a good deed, don't forget about Allah. It's not about us. It's about Allah. And Imam al-Ghazali, he says that, you know, when a person does a good deed, the first reaction is that they should say, Alhamdulillah. They should, they should thank Allah that Allah allowed them to do that good deed. And when a person commits a sin, the first reaction they should have is, Astaghfirullah, oh Allah, forgive me for this. And that Allah Ta'ala will forgive that person for that. And who knows, maybe the sincere repentance that that person makes as a result of that will elevate them to a higher status. They'll elevate them to a higher status. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept from us. Um, we'll come, we're, that's the end of the chapter. From the, I'm happy that we finished one whole chapter in one class uh, because the previous one was really long. We ask Allah ta'ala to make us humble. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from following our desires and being uh, you know, people who only think about ourselves even with good deeds. And we ask Allah ta'ala to forgive us of our sins. Um, 
Okay, let's do a couple of questions. What if what if the wrong that they've done is something which makes them more arrogant after you try and teach them and make them realize? You know, here's the thing, man, that's tricky about spirituality. Like people's spiritual state is like not anyone else's responsibility. And so a lot of people, you know, and they and this is a good question because a lot of people care about people and so they want to help them, right? Like a lot of people say, What if I do if somebody that I love? I think that they might be struggling with some, you know, ailments or spiritual ailment. The reality is, man, like, I'm sorry, not man. The reality is everybody, I'm just used to growing it up with, with other people who show up in Asa and others. The reality is everybody that unless a person is seeking assistance and help for what they think they might have, uh, you know, they're not going to, um, they're not going to want to, they're not going to see what you're saying. Right. Um, and so there's a certain level of sort of just, you know, pre-admittance that a person has to have before anything that you try to, uh, you know, teach somebody is ever going to have any impact on them. So the question, what if the wrong that they've done is something which makes them more arrogant and you try to teach them and make them realize, you know, if somebody's doing something wrong and and they are arrogant as a result of it, like, the, the the reality is like unless they're in a position to be advised, their spiritual state is not your responsibility, but you can make dua for them and you can be there for them. That's the biggest thing. Make dua for them and try to be there for them as much as you can. I know it's tough. I apologize. It's not a good answer, but it's just one of the things I know people get very frustrated because they try to help people so much, so much, so much. And the reality is that everyone is on their own journey, man. Like you can only try to help when people want help. That's the reality of it. Uh, stinginess impressive about themselves. What was the second? Uh, it was Hawa uh, Matbaron, I think. Yeah, it was uh, desires that are followed. Follow a person who follows all their desires. Um, okay, these were, yeah, all the lectures are saved on IGTV, by the way. How to cultivate healthy pride and not go into arrogance. Always, this is a good question. Always return it back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Always. Whatever good you do, realize that good could not have even been conceived or accomplished without Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if I fasted or gave charity or did something really good, I can feel happy, but I should connect that back to Allah. Alhamdulillah, alladhi hadani, that praise be to the one who guided me. Because if it weren't for him, like, I wouldn't have even done this, okay? I wouldn't have even done this. So always connect all the good you're doing back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, what if you're doing a fard or extra good deed in hopes of Allah answering your prayer uh, and a path for you and feeling guilty about it? Um, it's it's not that you're doing something so that Allah will open paths for you. It's not That's not something you feel guilty about because that's one of the things Allah ta'ala, you know, you do good deeds and you ask Allah, oh Allah, facilitate for me. That's okay. You can ask Allah by virtue of your deeds to help you. That's okay. That's not bad. That's not bad at all. As long as you're thinking about Allah, that's it. Right? Now, if you're doing fard or good deeds so that other people recognize that and are impressed by that, you know, maybe if I pray more, then she'll marry me. Maybe if I do this, then I'll do that. Like, those are things that we got to be really careful about. Maybe if I give sadaqah, then people will be impressed by me. No. That's what we got to be very careful with that. Uh, will Allah forgive even if you do the same sin over and over but feel shame after, but you cannot stop? Yes, Allah will forgive if you keep asking for Allah to forgive and if you keep trying to stop. Allah Ta'ala will always forgive if a person sincerely is trying to be forgiven. Allah stops forgiving when we stop asking. Okay? Um Is it not a responsibility even if it's family members? Yeah, technically, I mean, if they're an adult, that, you know, Allah Quran says that it's ultimately not your responsibility to, to, to guide someone else's spirituality. Ultimately, it's your job to be there for them. It's your job to encourage them, to advise them at whatever capacity they let you. But you can't break down walls. You know, you can't bust down walls and try to, if a person comes to you and says, hey, you know, what do you think? I'm kind of struggling with this or, hey, I want your advice. You know, you're my sibling. You're my cousin. You're my this. You're my that. Like, then, yeah, then then you can, of course. But it's more important for family and friends to 
be good influences, good environment, good role models, but more, but to say like, I'm here when you need me, you know, I'm here when you need me, because I think for most people it's, it's trying to, um, trying to bust down walls. And that unfortunately doesn't go too well with, with a lot of people. Allah knows best. How do you ask for forgiveness to Allah? There is a dua that you can look up called Sayyidul Istighfar, the uh, master of Istighfar. You should look it up. Google the master of uh, the best of forgiveness dua, Sayyidul Istighfar. Um, so what's the cutoff point? Where like, okay, this person can, can't stop sinning but keeps trying but seriously can't stop. How do you say, okay, this person just can't stop or he's not trying hard enough? You know, it, it's not for us to decide for somebody else. Um, everyone has to realize internally on their own what their capacity is. And, um, you know, some people are struggling with, with different kinds of, uh, you know, sinful behaviors that may have even crossed over from just independent behaviors to something that is uh, addiction. You know, it could be. Um, and in that case, it's, it's that person. The effort is what Allah Ta'ala is looking at. It's not the success or it's not... The effort. Allah Ta'ala wants to see a person sincerely trying their best. And that's what we learn from the hadith of the Prophet. That Allah Ta'ala, as long as a person's trying their best, that's all that Allah Ta'ala is looking uh is looking for in a person. And that Allah Ta'ala will give tawfiq as long as they stay the course and try their best. Right? And little victories, man, little victories. If somebody's struggling with something and it's a daily problem or it's a weekly problem or whatever, and they win one week or one day, they win. Then, then that's that's a victory, right? They got to be, you know, that's encouraging for them, inshallah. We ask Allah Ta'ala to give us tawfiq. Um, there are deeds that we only do for ourselves. Is this a lack of sincerity? Uh, it's hard. It depends on what you mean by ourselves. Like, I drink coffee for myself because I like coffee. No, it's not a lack of sincerity in that sense, meaning that, you know, this is talking more so about, um, more so about like worship-oriented deeds. Those are the ones, the the deeds that are ta'abudi in nature. They're worship-oriented, but things that are just, you know, drinking coffee, uh, you know, putting on my my shirt in the morning, you know, vacuuming my carpet, whatever. All of these things are, um, you know, all these things are uh, from the realm of just mundane actions. So doing them without Intending for Allah is not a sin because they're not worship oriented, but you can be rewarded if you think of Allah while you're doing them. Like I'm enjoying this coffee, which Allah Ta'ala gave me. Alhamdulillah. And I'm drinking it. Then it becomes a good deed. Allah alam. Is it permissible to make dua for your sibling even if they left Islam and technically became a non-believer, but you still have love for them? Yeah, of course you should make dua for them. Make dua that Allah Ta'ala guide them to Islam. Uh, you know, I have an eldest sister, by the way, who left Islam. So I, I understand the pain. Uh, and the difficulty, but yeah, absolutely, you should make dua for them, make dua that Allah Ta'ala guide them, um, and Allah Ta'ala, you know, bring their heart back to Him, and inshallah, inshallah, you know, they'll have iman in their heart, inshallah, absolutely. Um, okay, we'll end now, inshallah, or we'll take one question here. Do you have a tip with point number three, not following all your needs, because nowadays it's all about instant gratification? Um, yeah, like just be able not to, you know, fast, just be able not to do something that you want to do. You want to have coffee, don't have it. You know, um, I always tell people practice, practice holding back on things that are allowed, things that are permissible. Like I want to, I want to go on my phone right now. I want to look at my social media. No, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to leave my phone up here. I'm going to go have dinner with my family downstairs. I'm not going to, I'm, I'm not going to bring my phone downstairs. Right. Is it haram? No, but let's just see if I can do it. Right. Let's just see. So test yourself with some disciplines. Test yourself with some discipline. OK, inshallah, and see if you can do that. And then, you know, being able to fight off things that are haram becomes a little bit easier. We ask Allah Ta'ala to give us tawfiq. OK, everybody. I'll see everybody, inshallah, tomorrow. We have hard work here for young professionals. Um, and uh, so we're continuing the seerah of the life of the Prophet uh, after Uhud. It's really interesting. Tomorrow's going to be really interesting. 7 p.m. Central Time. Uh, and then Tuesday and Thursday, we have our uh, Imam Ghazali Perfecting the Prayer class where we read through his book. Uh, so Jazakallah khair, everybody. Barakallah fikum. If you enjoy the stuff that we do here at Roots, you're part of the community. 
Uh, you can sign up to support at rootsdfw.org slash sustain. We'd love your support. Uh, Barakallah, everybody. Take care. Zahra Khair. Assalamu alaikum. Love it, Captain.